Um, yeah, so I can introduce myself briefly. I I uh, have been, um, I became acquainted with Coptics, I would guess sometime around the, the late 90s or early 2000s. I, I think Darcy and, and I and Lori went through WSO and teachers training together um, in the early 2000s. And uh, Coptics always meant a lot to me on my spiritual journey. It really, um, John Davis was he was a mentor to so many of us, um, but you know he was he was just such an incredible uh, leader and uh, really inspired me. Um, so I'm very I, I'm so grateful for Coptics for its existence and for what it's done in my own life. Uh, I've been uh, I've been studying a course in miracles since 1993, and uh, I, I would say that my my. Um, approach to the course, you know, for the first couple of decades was actually somewhat eclectic. I, I saw myself as more of a, um, it was kind of like a tool and I had this big toolkit and I could take from it. And um, something really changed for me in um, sometime around uh, 10 years ago, maybe a little longer. Um, I had uh, really started to see the course as a spiritual path, as a Actually, in a very um, early stage of being an enduring spiritual tradition, standalone spiritual tradition um, that uh, is not not to suggest by any means that it wouldn't contain the same ecumenical spirit that you have at the Coptics, where all spiritual paths are seen as good and holy and and bringing light, but but actually approaching it and using it. Um, I recognized that uh, there was so much more I could I could get from it by adopting it as my spiritual path, because that's actually how it it actually speaks to this topic and says how I should be approaching it. So I've I've been um, headlong into the course. Uh, my my course practice consists of um, studying the text and the workbook. Those are the two primary volumes of the course. There's the third volume, the manual for teachers, but the the two the the course proper itself is the text in the workbook, um, so it's it's built around um, study of scripture in the Catholic tradition they call it lectio divina. It's a process of um, meditative reflection, um, and the, what what you're doing with the course is you're adopting a thought system. So it has all these technical terms. You're adopting it um, as a thought system, and it's kind of overlaying how you see the world your perception and your behavior, how you go out and the things that you say you do, um, these types of things are all in, um, infected by, by how you adopt this thought system. The, the workbook practice is very similar. It's how you integrate it. You, you're actually using words. You're, you're having moments of um, quietness where you, um, you are departing the world, you know, and it could be by departing the world, I mean, you just go sit on the sofa for five minutes or, or 15 minutes or 30 minutes and you follow the practice instructions. And by doing that, you're not, um, you're then going back out into the world, but you're carrying what you have practiced, that quietness, that stillness that you had, um, you're carrying it with you and it's instructing how you, again, how you interact with others. Um, so the course, like the, the, the objective of the course is um, like all spiritual traditions, especially those in, in the East and, and the mystical traditions in Christianity is to awaken. Uh, it's, it's to awaken to, to um, I guess you could call that God consciousness or um, just awareness of the memory of God is what the Course would say. Um, but it has this other objective of just tur turning you into a person of uncommon goodness, um, a person who is faithful, helpful, um, generous, kind, and uh, to, to, to borrow some of the words that Claudia used there from Hamad Bey, it's to recognize pain and suffering in other people. So if you're doing this right, your, your empathy is going to go off the charts, um, and you're going you're gonna to feel a deeper connection to humanity. And to me, that, that's what the spiritual journey is all about. Um, my topic for tonight is uh, oh and I guess just, I'll just say too I I've, I'm in Michigan my whole life so I've been I, I've lived on the west side of the state I've lived in mid Michigan um, and I'm a native of Oakland County so I'm back I'm back in Ferndale um, which is uh, I'm two blocks north of Eight Mile um, I like it here for now it's good um, 
I'm a civil servant. I'm a master of social work. I, I work for the, I'm an administrator for the state of Michigan in um, programs that serve uh, vulnerable adults and children and families. Uh, I've been doing that for 20 years. So that's that's an important part of, of what I do when I'm not, um, when I'm not writing or, or talking about A Course in Miracles. Um, I have a PowerPoint. I thought that would be the easiest way to do this. And I'm going to try. I've got two monitors here, so bear with me a moment while I try to share my screen. Um, do I have permission to share my screen? Let me try. Yes, Alan will help you with that. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can get this going. Okay, I want to... Um, want to get this out of the way so I can, let me see here, slideshow from beginning, and then I want to, I need to, I need to change this though, to move the monitor, let me see if I can do that real quick. Oh, display settings, swap presenter and slideshow. There we go. Okay, good. That wasn't too difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I chose my topic, uh, Choosing Your Way to Heaven, Binary Thinking and Spectrum Behavior and Course in Miracles. The reason I chose this topic is because A Course in Miracles is actually designed uh, through dialectical logic. It's this idea that um, you see things as, as oppositions. Um, I'll be talking about some of those. Some of them are, are very obvious. Um, life, death, illusion, um, truth, um, light, dark, right? We, we can all think of all the ways you have opposing think, thinking. And um, the, the idea of binary thinking is that once you understand those two terms, then you're, there's no in-between. You're, you're training your mind to see things so that there's no there's no middle ground between the two. Um, it, there's a there's actually in in uh, Christianity in in the early Christian church there's a, a first century uh, text that's not part of the bi biblical canon but it could be because it's universally understood to be authentic uh, part of the early church. It's called the Didache and. Uh, it's, it's opening text, so it's written by early Christians in the first century, first or second century, but most believe it was written in the first century. And it's, its opening words are, there is a way of life and there is a way of death. And apart from these two, there's, there is no other way. Um, so this idea is not unique to the Course. It's part of, it's part of the, um, how mystical Christianity has related to um, similar ideas. But what's interesting about binary thinking is it is not popular right now in, in any other circle. Uh, in psychology, it's considered um, to be a roadblock for people to get out of their heads. They see everything as black and white. So binary thinking, you, you won't find anyone teaching people how to think binarily. They, they're, we're teaching people what's what one scholar called spectrum thinking. Um, in, um, in spirituality, you see the same thing. I, I, I think I, saw, I read something by, uh, um, oh, who's the contemplative Christian, um, Rome, uh, is his name? Uh, I'm, he's, he's quite famous. He's out in New Mexico, but, um, Rohr, Richard Rohr. Uh, yeah, where, again, it was another piece about get, snapping people out of binary thinking. And even like in the I, in in my work, I do I do a lot of anti racism work and uh, trying as we address disparities in um, child and adult welfare, but also just in workplaces in general. Um, when you're working with diverse populations and um, this either or thinking, black and white thinking, it's it's perceived it's considered pernicious. People that are outwardly racist oftentimes are because of their binary thinking. Uh, they they are being told, you know, look at this person who doesn't look like you 
um, has different skin color, different culture, and they are just like you. You you share humanity with them, and they can't they can't get there because binary thinking has taught them I am this, they are that. So so where my my point with with that kind of like the tour of um, binary thinking, it, it's not very popular, and and there's a lot of risks involved. There's a lot of um, you know it, it can. It can it can rather than deepen your humanity, it's it seems like it can um, seriously seriously arrest your your humanity. And so my question that I have is, why is the course training us to think binarily? Like then, if if there's if it's um, seen so derisively, um, so the current <clears throat> the current conversation and in, in what what I see and like I don't um, you know I don't I don't hang out too much with uh, with other uh, larger study groups in, in this with the, the, the larger course community. But it seems like the current conversation is everyone is, is talking about non-dualism. You know, there's a lot of popular non-dualist teachers out there nowadays. Um, not the idea of non-dualism. Uh, there's, of course, varieties of non-dualism, but it's simply um, oftentimes not two, but one. And so this idea that, um, you know, you can think of yin yang, um, you can think of, um, Advaita Vedanta taught in in uh, India. Um, the course is non non dual, and in my opinion, I think that uh, non dualism oftentimes is is seeing everything blended is to into one. So um, all the forces that appear opposing come together, and it's one. The course doesn't adopt that view at all. Its version of non duality is where you do have you do have two sides. But one side is real, the other one isn't. So it, it's literally like a severing uh, or or a disappearance of one half, which I think is different than a lot of the Eastern non-duals teachings. But but my my question for for course students and the community at large, um, for those who um, and I and I apologize for not maybe I, I don't know where everyone is at with um, with understanding the course. I mean, there's <laughs> I could dive into like a. a, a an intro, but I'm assuming everyone is basically familiar with what A Course in Miracles is. Um, I don't think that's going to, we're going to have time to talk about that. But for those that study the course, you know, a conversa a better conversation would be, um, you know, the course is dialectic and its approach to learning. Um, concepts are explained through binary logic. Like, let's try to understand that. I think that would be a better conversation than talking about where the course fits in um, on this spectrum of, of non-dualism. Um, so I want to define what dialectical is. Dialectical um, is a term that um, has different meanings in different contexts. Here, though, I think that uh, the, the, best, the best way to understand it is it's relating to a logical discussion of ideas and opinions that are concerned with or acting through opposing forces. So that's that's it, my understanding of dialectic. And so here, this is an introduction to the Course in Miracles. This is not an introduction to the text or the workbook or the manual. It's to the whole thing. Um, this course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. So here, if you if you if you picture like a, a yin yang symbol or a a circle divided in two, black and white, right? The real is half of it. The unreal is the other half. That that other half just, it goes away. It's not real. It doesn't exist. And so what you're left with is only what is real, life, truth, love. Um, those things are, those things are eternal and they are real. Um, so yeah, going back to my contemporary criticism of binary thinking, I want to read this quote. This is from Fred Robinson. I believe he's a psychologist. He says, binary thinking, also known as dichotomous thinking, happens when complex concepts, ideas, and problems are overly simplified into either or perspective. Binary thinking is black and white, good or bad, always or never. The gray area in the middle is ignored or goes unnoticed. As we live in a world filled with multitude of political, religious, and economic interests, Binary thinking can and does create an incredible impasse. We feel the strain of binary thinking all around us every day, 
this leads to biases and prejudice. So not, not really an endorsement. Um, and um, let's see. Um, spectrum thinking is kind of like seen as this alternative to binary thinking. So here's another quote from Fred Robinson. If, if binary thinking is black and white, spectrum thinking um, is life in technicolor. Spectrum thinkers use new neural cultivating use neural cultivating to tease binary questions apart and diffuse antagonism. These people look for the complexities and nuances that drive perspectives. They uncover and explore with compassion and empathy. Even though we have our preferences, a grow, growth mindset allows us to suspend those preferences and consider new thoughts and ideas. Spectrum thinking demands more energy and cognitive load. And what I want to suggest is that um, he kind of says it here. Um, you tease apart binary questions. The course, a course in miracles, when you're doing it, when you're doing, when you're applying it the way I believe it's intended to be applied, um, you do create spectrum behavior. Your behavior, what you, when by behavior, I just mean the things that you you say to other people, the things that you you do in this world when we're out, um, when we're in our, our interpersonal relationships. We are, we are opening ourselves up to a much broader um, spectrum of behavior through this, um, using this binary logic. Okay, so um, here's another um, uh, idea on, on what either or black and white thinking is. Um, and again, it's, it's um, in anti-racism literature, it's considered a pillar of white supremacist thinking. It's a it's a barrier to structural transformation. In uh, in a nineteen a famous nineteen forty study uh, doll study conducted by psychologist Kenneth and Mamie Clark, um, five year olds were consistently choose to play with a white doll over playing with a black doll, regardless of the child's race. And when asked the reason for their choice, the common answer was that the white dolls were good and the black dolls were bad. If this thinking is not examined and corrected, the child will grow into adulthood with conscious or unconscious race bias. And this was true of children that were, as it says, regardless of the child's race. Um, so, so this idea of seeing things in black and white, good or bad, it starts at a young age. We start, we start uh, the, A Course in Miracles teaches us that um, we are constantly putting things into uh, our perception is so selective that we are constantly looking out at the world and we're evaluating it and we're putting it onto a spectrum of, of how we value it. So we do this with bodies and we do it based on weight, on age, on skin color, on education, on socioeconomic status. And we're doing this evaluation and then we're, we're, we're completely shoving it down into our unconscious and we're completely unaware that we're doing it. Um, and this is, this is part of the human condition. And so the binary logic in the course is teaching us how our minds are actually already operating so that we can rein it in and start seeing things um, from those extreme, the, those extreme sides of the binary. Um, the binary parting of parting of key course concepts is replete. A partial list would include, in addition to perception and knowledge, um, dark and light, death and life, death and life, fear and love, ego and Holy Spirit, evil and good, attack and forgiveness, specialness and holiness, separation and oneness, <clears throat> guilt and sinlessness, illusion and truth, pain and joy body and spirit. And this is just a partial list. But um, the, the one that uh, I want to focus on momentarily is perception and knowledge. Because um, we obviously exist in a world of perception. And what our concept of, of knowledge might be a little different than um, what the Course teaches knowledge is. 
The student, in A Course in Miracles, the student must rely on many technical definitions of words and concepts that carry different meaning from their conventional meaning. So take as an example the term knowledge. And this is, uh, this is coming from the text. To know is to be certain. Uncertainty merely means that you don't know. Knowledge is power because it is certain, and certainty is strength. Perception is temporary. It is an attribute of the space-time belief and is therefore subject to fear or love. Misperception produces fear and true perception induces love. Neither produces certainty because all perception varies. This is why it is not knowledge. True perception is the basis for knowledge, but knowing is the affirmation of truth. All of your difficulties ultimately stem from the fact that you do not recognize or know yourself, your brother, or God. And, you know, so here we have this very lofty concept of knowledge. Knowledge is completely outside the realm of perception. The closest we can get to it is what the Course calls true perception, in which our perception is a reflection of that truth. It's a reflection of knowledge. It's a reflection of heaven. But we can't have knowledge and still perceive. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a different definition than what we think of when we think of knowledge. Um, so how does the course train us to use this binary logic? The course student is frequently reminded that they are at all times faced with a choice. A choice for light, life, love, the Holy Spirit, for forgiveness. This is the primary strategy for the course. It wants us to learn to see the contrast be between two polarized ideas. It wants to remove the complexity of what is seen in between these ideas. The complexity and nuance brought on by spectrum thinking is not the focus of the exercise that the course is teaching you. Here are its own words on this matter. And this is from um, the chapter 26 in the text. Yet who can make a choice between the wish for heaven and the wish for hell unless he recognizes that they are the same? They are not the same. Excuse me. This difference is the learning goal that this course is set. It will not go beyond this aim. It only, its only purpose is to teach what is the same and what is different, leaving room to make the only choice which can be made. There is no basis for a choice in this complex and overcomplicated world for no one understands what is the same and seems to choose where no choice really is. So I think we can all agree with that, right? We, we, you don't make, you're, you're only making a choice um, when you, once you understand that there's a difference between the two things you're making, you're, you're, you're deciding between. Um, so what's the problem with spectrum thinking, like just out of the box spectrum thinking, you know, trying to, trying to basically on your own, just see everything, say, you know what, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to look at, I'm going to take the, the, the 10,000 foot view here and try to look at my, my life situation, my relationship, my, whatever it is, um, that you're faced with, that you're, you're trying to, um, maybe improve upon in your life. And why, why not just go right at spectrum thinking instead of this binary approach? Um, with binary, it, it's the ability to, spectrum thinking is the ability to appreciate complexity, nuance, personal history, social context, and a variety of other factors that impact our decision making. This obviously sounds far more mature in approach than casting everything into good and bad buckets. So why might the course so heavily lean on binary thinking? Well, it comes down to our version of spectrum thinking. All the suggested responses, the plans of actions for how to live our lives, and the ideas for what we are inspired to do and say in this world through our behavior is filled with, with toxic and unhealthy desires. Spectrum thinking under the direction of the ego leads to ideas like sacrifice, um, compromise, and bargaining with our brothers with guilt as a form of currency. To properly judge the world, you would need to be aware of far too many complexities which are always changing, and even those complexities that you misperceive. 
Trying to see all angles introduces confusion and uninspired decisions filled with doubt. It is no wonder we doubt when you consider how complex the world is. In other words, we try to see the full spectrum, but our minds are biased against the truth. And um, I have a quote. Um, I'm going to read this quote, and then I'll go back to the other slide. This is from the Manual for Teachers. Um, it's, it's from a section called, How is Judgment Relinquished? Remember how many times you thought you knew all the facts you needed for judgment and how wrong you were? Is there anyone who has not had this experience? Would you know how many times you merely thought you were right without ever realizing you were wrong? Why would you choose such an arbitrary basis for decision-making? Wisdom is not judgment. It is the relinquishment of judgment. Make then but one more judgment. It is this. There is someone with you whose judgment is perfect. He does know all the facts, past, present, and to come. He does know all the effects of his judgment on everyone and everything involved in any way. And he is wholly fair to everyone, for there is no distortion in his perception. And this is, this is where we're led to and we're trained that someone with the capital S is the Holy Spirit. That's God's own voice who is there to speak to us and direct us and, and help, help us to, um, to, to give us that 10,000 view, foot view when we, we can't get it on our own. Um, I can't say I've experienced the benefit of this in my own life. Um, when I consider a matter that is weighing on me, such as a forgiveness project with another person, and I have a few of those, um, I'm reminded in my prayers and practice that what I think my brother did to me has not occurred. In reality, it has not occurred. If I attack, I suffer. If I forgive, salvation will be given me. There is no in-between. My practice time is spent forgiving my brother in totality and seeing him in the light of joy and contentment that comes from having his burden of guilt lifted off of him. There is no compromise, no bargaining, and no sacrifice on my part. Now, when I say when I sit down to practice, I see my brother and I forgive him in totality. That's because I'm practicing. That's because I'm concentrating. It's much, it's not as easy when I'm walking around in, in everyday life. My grievances creep in. And I can feel them. I can feel their presence. I know that they haven't gone away completely. But if I can momentarily step away from that for whatever it be, five minutes of, for every hour, two minutes on the hour, um, or in my morning or evening meditation, we're making giant strides and we're not even aware of it sometimes. Um, we are chipping away at those projects of forgiveness that we have to um that we have that are, are burdening us and weighing us down. Um, here's a quote from the text. Certainty is always of God. When you love someone, you have perceived him as he is, and this makes it possible for you to know him. But it is not until you recognize him that you will know him. So here, here in this passage, I love this because the binary is basically saying, you don't know your brother. You don't know the person because if you did, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't need this body to, to perceive with. Um, you would be as in the state that Jesus is in now, which is complete oneness with God and, and um, at, at one in, in uh, outside of space time completely. Um, but, but there's something that's falling just short of knowledge here. And if you, if you read it carefully, it's right here. Um, oops. When you love someone, right? Anyone can relate to that. You can ask, you can ask, uh, we could have a group of preschoolers here, right? And say, what does it mean to love somebody? And they'd all have an answer for you and it would be right. We all know what it's like to love another person. And so we can let that love guide us towards knowledge. Um, when you love someone, think of all the beautiful ways you can finish that sentence. We've all experienced love in different ways. Loving another person is a reflection 
of the higher recognition of that person's true and eternal identity. Loving another person falls within a spectrum because our love is not as stable as knowledge. The important takeaway, though, is that we are never expected to believe that our love is perfect. We are all making steps along the journey one choice at a time. Um, and uh, so, so just to give another example of how this applies to uh, in the world, you know, the course, a course in miracles, is not really recognized for having um, a tradition of spiritual healing. But um, that's one of my goals in life is is to help people see that uh, you know Jesus's ministry in in the first century was one of teaching and healing. If you if you read the gospel stories, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, where the, the miracle stories of his healing, he taught, he healed, he taught, he healed. He went into synagogues, he gathered crowds, he taught. Sometimes they liked what he said, sometimes they chased him away. Um, but he was healing people. He was literally healing the sick and the dead, bringing them back to life, not doing just psychosomatic healing. He was actually healing people of serious illnesses. And his reputation as a healer spanned all of the Near East. Um, people were aware of him and knew of his reputation as a healer. And so A Course in Miracles is another iteration of this first century ministry. It's just a continuation of the same ministry that he started. And he's training us as his disciples to be healers. And the modality for healing is a lot different than some of the more modern modalities that we see for spiritual healing. But it comes down to one basic perception, and that is seeing the, the, the person, the patient, the person that is sick, that has a, a sick body. What the healer is doing is they're seeing them in the moment of their creation. In the moment of your creation, when God created us, he didn't create us as evolving beings. He created us whole. He created us with the conditions of eternity, formlessness, changelessness. We are eternal, changeless, formless beings. And in the moment of our creation, we were created whole. And when Jesus healed somebody, it was oftentimes because that person was ready to accept the healing. They were doing their part. His part was to see them in the moment of their creation. And that's how he was able to do this healing. And it might have involved putting his hand on their shoulder or on their forehead. It might have been saying words, but it might have also involved him not even being in the room. It might have involved him not touching or laying his hands on anyone. So this, this tradition is, is alive in this, in this course. And um, we, we will see examples of it. And I want to give you an idea of like, well, then, then what was his relationship to suffering then? And this is this is from Lesson 248. And um, it's such stark language, but you can see how carefully you have to read it. So I'm going to read the, the title of Lesson 248 is, Whatever Suffers is Not Part of Me. I have disowned the truth. Now let me be as faithful in disowning falsity. Whatever suffers is not part of me. What grieves is not myself. What is in pain is but illusion in my mind. What dies was never living in reality and did but mock the truth about myself. Now I disown self-concepts and deceits and lies about the Holy Son of God. Now am I ready to accept him back as God created him and as he is. And this is the mindset that the Holy Son of God is your brother. Um, it's not just Jesus. And, and so to see that patient, to see that person in front of you that might have been hemorrhaging, might have been blind, and to not to recognize that is not that is not who this person is, um, is a way of separating yourself from sickness, but doing it without losing the empathy of recognizing who it is that is standing across from you. Um, one other example of, of dialectical logic, I'm gonna read this quote from the text, chapter 23. Illusions meet illusions, truth itself. 
The meeting of illusions leads to war. Peace, looking on itself, ex extends itself. War is the condition in which fear is born and grows and seeks to dominate. Peace is a state where love abides and seeks to share itself. Conflict and peace are opposites. Where one abides, the other cannot be. Where either goes, the other disappears. So is the memory of God obscured in minds that have become illusions battleground. Yet far beyond this senseless war, it shines, ready to be remembered when you side with peace. Um, and I'm going to read one other quote, and then I think I'm done. <laughs> So this is uh, this is another example of dialectical logic. Seek you no further. This is from the workbook. There is nothing else for you to find except the peace of God, unless you seek for misery and pain. This is the final point to which each must come at last, to lay aside all hope of finding happiness where there is none, of being saved by what can only hurt, of making peace of chaos, joy of pain, and heaven out of hell. Attempt no more to win through losing, nor to die to live. You cannot but be asking for defeat. Yet you can ask as easily for love, for happiness, and for eternal life. In peace, it has no ending. Ask for this, and you can only win. To ask for what you have already must succeed. To ask for what is false, be true, can only fail. Forgive yourself for vain imaginings and seek no longer what you cannot find. For what can be more foolish than to seek and seek and seek again for hell when you have but to, to look with open eyes to find that heaven lies before you through a door which opens easily to welcome you. And that is my, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, Welcome. I hope I did good on time. I, I, <laughs> I should have asked ahead of time if I hope I kept us on schedule. <laughs> yes, we're still fine. I, um, your your talk about um, binary thinking is just so relevant for where we are in um, as in our human world these days and um i think it's a very very timely topic and i love the way you um you gathered the information from the course to help us better understand how we <laughs> so maybe unwittingly are not thinking outside the box um you know when it comes to that binary thinking yeah, yeah. I think we we always strive to think like I got to get big picture, right? And we try to like use everything from our toolbox. But really, the the course. What I love about the course is it's in the moment of stillness that the answer comes to you. So it's when you actually stop, you turn everything off, and it's uh, it's it's like something from the outside, outside this world, outside your mind, is coming into it. And it, it wouldn't have come alone had you not stopped. Um, and uh, and and that's and when you had that happen, and I know uh, just from looking around the room that we've all had that experience, right? We've we've had it numerous times, and it's it's it feels like magic when it happens. And uh, yeah, so so that that's something that we can you know we can train ourselves to to have more and more of those experiences. There's so much beautiful simplicity in the course, and yet it's not easy, right? <laughs> because of our training, you know, in the human world. So um, I, I'd like to open um, open it up to anyone else who might have comments or questions or um, you know anything else that we might want to want to ask of Joe. I want to thank Joe very much for a very in depth. Uh, conversation about the course. It was great. We are all one. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. 
Yeah, I was very Thank interested you. to hear how you would present the idea of binary thinking, because as you say, so much of our culture and society is against it. Uh, and to some degree for good reason, but the binary thinking is a good way to at least map out the territory with landmarks. And then once, once you've kind of got a good handle on where the boundaries are, then you can start going back into that spectrum th thinking to identify, well, this isn't that end or that end, it's somewhere in the middle, but at least I know where it sits on, on the field at, in a way. I, so I think that's I was, a great, yeah, that's a great way of putting it, the landmarks, I love that idea. Yeah, I was really, really glad to hear how you explain the differences between the two. Yeah, and you know, the, the, I was thinking as you were you were saying that, Alan. I think that the 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 big focus, like the when you think of like the binary, what is the one that we're supposed to really be focusing on? It's it's I think it's the idea of partial forgiveness, because we're all all of us are making, um, we're doing sometimes it's unconscious justifications for why we're holding on to grievances. Somebody hasn't, you know, they've given a little bit, but they haven't given enough of what we really want in their, their mea culpa. Um, and so we hold it, we hold it against them. And I think the the binary teaches us that you're not getting anywhere with partially forgiving people. Um, and, and just the fact that we, we still have remnants of unforgiveness shouldn't deter us. I think we all, that's just part of the human condition. It takes decades sometimes, but the course is all about forgiveness. I mean, that's, it's a spiritual path built around the concept of forgiving. You can actually forgive. I mean, if you think about the course teaches that Jesus probably had his moment of awakening on the cross, you know, so he was beaten, tortured, betrayed. Um, he had, his followers were terrified um, nobody was expecting him to appear in the flesh after all that was said and done. And the fact that he did demonstrated everything else that he taught about the truth was true. And so it was a very extreme example. And, and he tells us in the course, you're not expected to go through those steps that I went through. You're not supposed to martyr yourself. You don't have to. But it's an extreme example. And through that extreme example, you can say, well, if he, if he encountered all of that up until his death and was still able to forgive everything and everyone to the point where he was able to come back and, and give some instruction to his disciples on what to do next after he was dead as a doornail, um, then it's a very powerful message. Anyone else have something to share? Laura Joy? Yeah, I, I don't need, uh, have any to specifically share. Hi, Joe. Hi, um, um, but what I'd like to do is, Joe, would you be willing to uh, take any uh, questions or uh, just contact with you at another time? Yeah, absolutely. My, Could you uh, um, put that maybe in the chat, your, your email yeah, address? Absolutely. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see everyone. I really enjoyed the talk tonight. I'm a newbie to the course, only about five years. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a lifelong a lifelong journey. Sure is. Yeah. Thank you. I wish I had more of a Christmas topic. Um, it just so <laughs> happened. I when I when Connie asked me about this, I thought I'm gonna find something about um Jesus's uh story, you know, the, the Christmas story. But uh no, this this kind of jumped out at me as kind of like being in the moment. It seems like it's such a cultural uh idea that uh, I, I couldn't resist. So <laughs> Well, we very much appreciate your being with us this evening. It's wonderful to see you again. <laughs> it's been <laughs> many years. <laughs> and I 
know if there are no other questions or comments that Claudia has something for us. So anyone else have something that they would like to share? Hey, Joe, I, this is Pete Wheeling. Hi, Pete. I, I think it was great what you just talked about. Very complex. It's, it's very complex. The human mind is very complex. <laughs> Culver Simmons, you know, it's natural. We, we do it. We don't even realize we do it until later on. I go, oh, man, I didn't forget that guy. And, <clears throat> but I also know that Jesus was a healer. Jesus, Jesus was a healer. But he always said, I didn't heal you. Your faith healed you. Your faith did. So what you're talking about is faith. Faith in the word, the Holy Spirit, right? A absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And the Course the course says that uh, when it talks about spiritual healing, it does say that um, there's nothing in the healer that's not in the patient. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm. Joe, there's a request in the chat. If you could just put your email address in there. So oh, that oh I did, but it looks like I sent it directly to Pete. Um Oh. <laughs> okay. So let me try that again. It's Joe. There we go. Thank you. There is okay. Thank you so much. Well, before I turn it over to Claudia for our closing, I would just like to wish each and every one of you a blessed holiday season, a Merry Christmas, a very prosperous New Year. Um, enjoy your families, the peace, the peace and contentment of the season. Try to let go of some of the busyness and really enjoy the message that um, that this Merry Christmas does bring us. So. Wonderful to see you tonight. And Claudia? Thank you, Darcy. You're welcome. Well, Joe, I'm not exactly sure why I called you and asked you to speak, other than the fact that I had heard you and seen you before at the Coptic Center, and I was really inspired. And so tonight was also inspiring and we thank you so much for that thank you Claudia. so let's just take a few minutes and get quiet and take a couple breaths we are all healers we came here that way we all want to help others. And yes, it's, our world is really complicated, but if we think every day and just say, let's open our minds and not take the words so literally and not forget to forgive ourselves when we speak something and then find that it wasn't really true. It's kind of a juggling act. And we're so grateful for each other so that we can teach each other how to forgive, how to learn, how to pray, how to open up to all the love that is here on this planet. It's such a beautiful, amazing place. I challenge you to start being aware when you get caught up in a poor me attitude or somebody says, oh, the weather is terrible today, shift it around. You'd be surprised. I've been doing it for a lot of years. Shift those negative thoughts and speak them to people. 
and tell them about the joy in your life and the joy on our planet. And we're so thankful for Mother Earth and all of her beauty and all the things that she provides us. Yes, go into this Christmas season and the new year with joy in your heart and work on those steps of forgiving, including yourself. Sometimes that's the hardest one to forgive. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a wonderful time celebrating and we will see you again. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, everyone, thank you, Claudia. Good to see you, Judy. And thank you, Joel. That was just uh, so enlightening. <laughs> thank you, Joe. You all. Thank you, Joe. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.